Goatsi. My name is Sarah Marie Ortiz, and I am an enrolled citizen of Pueblo of Acoma. And I also um, am greatly privileged to serve as a Native Education Program Manager for Highline Public Schools. Um, I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and grew up um, all around New Mexico. Um, my Pueblo, uh, my tribal lands are central New Mexico area. And um, I also grew up, uh, in I'd like to say almost Texas in uh, Eastern New Mexico. And I've had the great privilege to work and live and love and dream in the usual and accustomed territories of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe and the many um, tribal peoples who were the original stewards of the Duwamish River, the Green River, Cedar River and White River and the Salish Sea. Um, and I'm zooming from Three Tree Point, one of the most beautiful, beautiful parts of our beautiful Highline area. Describe your work with the Native Education Program at Highline Public Schools. My work with the Highline Public Schools Native Education Program has been such a journey and is so rich and immersive in so many ways. It really is a masterclass um, in terms of engaging and supporting leadership among our community and our families um, and really lifting up the importance of system change within American education. When uh, I first came into this work uh, in K-12, um, I came as a, a graduate of tribal college. I graduated from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, which is one of our most powerful, um, prominent tribal colleges and centers of indigenous thought in the country and really in the world. And so I came into K-12 work with a really solid foundation of teachings about native history, native culture, the importance of native languages, and really um, doing everything that, that we can as a community, a community of teachers, educators, leaders, to cultivate access to really rich opportunities for cultural learning and rigorous learning for our Native students, our American Indian and Alaska Native students, um, and doing that in all the spaces possible within our classrooms, but far beyond the classroom, making spaces um, available in community where students can connect with one another and connect around their, their tribal histories and cultures and families can connect with one another. Um, educators can come together and learn from one another. And so we really have done our very, very best over the past um, about eight years. I started in, um, in school year 2013, 2014. Um, to, to, to really cultivate those rich uh, learning spaces and make sure that we're constantly lifting up and centering uh, tribal languages, really doing all we can to remind our teachers about the, the rich history of our urban native community here and the hundreds of tribal nations that are represented in our urban native community and honoring our tribal partners like Muckleshoot and Suquamish and, and, and those, those Duwamish leaders over at the Longhouse. Um, we are in such a special position geographically, um, intellectually, emotionally, um, as native educators in this area to be able to connect, connect with one another across district lines, across city lines and be able to, to give, give so much um, opportunity to our native students to be developed as leaders, as the, the cultural leaders of tomorrow, the tribal leaders of tomorrow, nonprofit leaders, scientists, doctors. Um, and, and that really is uh, uh, one of our primary aims is to just develop our native students in a way that um, is affirming to them and in a way that centers their voices, their dreams and their experiences. And that goes from uh, pre-K all the way through 12th grade. Um, so lots of culturally grounded college and career access learning opportunities, things like our Native Youth Leadership Academy, our Highline Native Student Success Summit. Um, we have our Black and Native Leaders Speaker Series, which has been supported by Highline Heritage, as well as um, events like our Indigenous People Celebration, our Indigenous People Story Art and Film Fest, which we hosted at the Highline Heritage Museum, after school programming, our Summer Academy. 
So these offerings that are um, offered up throughout the whole school year and in summertime, um, we, we, we just challenge ourselves all the time to think about all those rich spaces where students and families can come together and learn with each other um, and, and support each other in, in, in learning about our, our shared tribal histories and cultures um, and, and also help us to get better as a system. Uh, we have um, even uh, policy changes that have been made within our Highland Public Schools. When I first came into the district, I sat down with our Director of Policy Development, Holly Ferguson, and um, we developed one of the only Native education specific policies in our region um, and really throughout the country to really serve as a guiding framework for our Board of Directors, our superintendent, all of our senior leaders on how to honor the treaties, how to honor our students who are citizens of sovereign tribal nations from all over the country, um, and how to really give primacy and, and um, invest deeply in, in Native student success in Highland Public Schools. How does your cultural identity inform and shape your approach to your work in the community? Cultural identity um, being very complex and really at the crux of everything I am um, as a as an Akuma woman um, and and previously as an Akuma as a native child and adolescent teenager growing up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and then coming to such a special place like Highline, which reminds me a lot of, of my, my, my home in, in the desert in many ways, even though the geography is very different. There has just been so much that I've been taught um, as, as a native person growing up and also as a mixed person um, being raised uh, in, in a community like Albuquerque, New Mexico, which um, there wasn't a whole lot of, um, uh, economic opportunity in the neighborhood where, where I was, but it was very culturally rich. And I was very, very connected to my Pueblo culture, participating in my ceremonies and, and traditional practices and just being reminded again and again, how important um, those things were by my elders, by my relatives, um, and also my mom, who's non-native, um, her making sure that I was very connected to my culture and all of those traditional teachings and that I um, that I regarded it as a precious thing. And so even though in public schools, even though we had a native education program in Albuquerque public schools, um, that wasn't my primary reminder um, of, of who I was as an Akama person. Um, and so it was very important that I stayed connected to my tribal community. And now coming uh, to work um, in Highline in my capacity, I know just how important it is being in such a deeply urban center. Uh, many of our native students um, are far away from their tribes, um, from their reservations or tribal communities. And so they don't have that ready access to books and art and all of those baskets of cultural knowledge uh, that are so important to our students. And so it's so important um, that those of us who work in Native education and public schools, that, uh, that we constantly reaffirm our commitment to cultivating those spaces um, and those baskets of knowledge that, that we can reach out you know, across the country and really the world to bring in those, um, th those baskets of knowledge for, for our students and our families to access. Um, it's particularly important in our urban, um, suburban area, and uh, we, take, we take our mission very seriously in that way. How has the community you serve been affected by the COVID pandemic? COVID-19 and this pandemic that none of us have ever experienced before, it has definitely impacted our urban native community, our Highline community in a, in a very particular way. We, um, as American Indian and Alaska native people, are still um, connected along some spectrum, some of us deeply, deeply connected to relatives who live back home in our tribal communities and are served by Indian Health Service and tribal services and often um, 
some of those services can be very limited. For instance, my uh, hospital at my Pueblo um, was just uh, taken away. They just took our hospital away because of uh, deficiencies in the Indian Health Service. And you hear stories about this um, across Indian country and across our urban native communities being impacted by um, less than adequate access to healthcare um, and human services, basic services. Um, so what we're seeing in this pandemic is so many of our schools, our programs, um, really wanting to focus on distance learning and uh, making sure that students are logging on and attending classes, but really, really focusing out of necessity on basic necessities. Um, and so getting, getting food and <clears throat> other resources and supports to families, gift cards. So many people have lost their jobs. Um, so many people have lost loved ones and they're grieving. And so the cultural um, supports, the, the ceremonies, um, access to, um, to culturally grounded um, mental health services, those have been at the top of the list when it comes to what our, what our families um, are needing in this time. And also just because we can't physically be with one, one another in so many cases right now, um, just being present and being visible and connecting, calling, texting, emailing, inviting to Zoom, saying, please come and just be with us, come and have lunch with us um, at our Native uh, student lunch group, or come to our family night, or come to this event on Zoom, and um, just making sure that our families know that we're still here um, as, as, as a program, as program leaders, as district leaders, but as relatives. Um, primarily that we're we're here as family and that we as native people that we're going to continue to take care of one another regardless in the way that we have always done by tending to our relationships no matter if it's a pandemic or an apocalypse <laughs> that we just want to make sure that we that we're we're loving each other and that we're caring for one another always who are your role models I've had some incredible mentors, elders, teachers, coaches, um, those who have just given me hope and strength and made me uh, the person that I am today. I um, am so grateful to so many of the elders of this area who have, um, even though I'm from a, a tribe far, far away, have 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 embraced me, put their arms around me, and um, taught me so many things about the history and the culture and the protocols of of these lands. Um, our language leaders um, and speakers in this area also are so inspiring to me. Um, I, my list is so long in terms of people who have mentored me, but um, Patsy Whitefoot, who is from the Great Yakima Nation, uh, who I've been. Um, allowed to serve in, in leadership capacities with and mentored by pretty much uh, since I first first arrived in Highline. Um, she's got family all over the Northwest. Um, Patsy never stops moving. Uh, but, I, but I think of Patsy because Patsy has advocated at every single level, at a hyper-local level within her tribal community, extending out into multiple tribal communities where she has relatives all around like the Columbia River area, all the way to across Muckleshoot, Highline, Suquamish up north, and is constantly building relationships um, in the interest of service and, and serving our, our, our community far and wide um, and advocating and even enacting policy change at both the local, um, state and federal level and, and making sure that um, she's always a voice for and advocating um, for students and, and families and, and really advocating that families be not just included in, in, in choice making processes and in leadership within public schools in particular, but that they're actually centered and elevated and given primacy. And we're seeing in this time that because so much of um, student learning is being directed by and supported by parents and, and families, those who are in the home, that it should have always been that way, that schools um, should have always been honoring the, the agency and the expertise and the brilliance 
of our, our, our native families, um, our parents and our aunties and grandmas and grandpas. And, 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 and it just, um, it's, it's an amazing thing to me to, to, to reflect on the, the many teachings over time that, that Patsy has shared with me and also affirmations of those teachings that I've received from, um, from, from, from my own, from my, from my blood uh, aunties, uncles, grandmothers, um, my dad, of course, uh, has been a huge mentor, um, especially when it comes to storytelling, uh, the role of the arts and literature in our lives and, and how, um, how important it is for our, our native children and youth to see themselves as writers, as um, orators and storytellers and culture keepers, knowledge keepers. Um, so I've had a lot, a lot, lot of good mentorship and I could never, ever, ever um, list everybody, um, but I, I'm gonna commit myself to <laughs> sitting down and, and writing that list one day. And uh, I think that's so important is saying thank you to those people who have shaped you and made you who you are. Please share about your poetry and art. I am so privileged to be an artist and to be grown by artists. When I think about my practice, uh, my creative process, why I became a writer, why I've continued to be a writer, and why I've continued to be an advocate and a champion for um, for new new artists, new new writers, and and those who have been like legacy and doing this practice for a long time. I really do um, consider it to be a continuum and I would even argue um, a spirit continuum in that we don't become who we are, whether we're artists or um, doctors, which is also art, healers, um, teachers, we, we don't come into that practice by accident. I truly believe that and I've been taught that by by, by my teachings, my elders, um, that we're chosen, uh, that we're brought to it, and we have to continually um, be affirmed in our practice and challenge ourselves in our practice uh, to keep doing um, what, what will be of service, what's important to the community, um, what, what is an important um, service to, to the community and the world. And so when I first started writing, um, when I was only uh, an adolescent, uh, about 13, 14 years of age, I won my first creative writing award when I was 14. Um, I, I took it very seriously at that time also. I, I think I really came into a new understanding of the teaching that when we write, when we speak, we're not just saying something about the world. We're not just telling a story. We're actually creating the world. We're engaging in an act of making. And that's a sacred act and it's a sacred responsibility. Um, and it was no accident that when I first started writing in earnest um, and being recognized for my writing, I was also with, I was with a child. I, I was about to give birth to a baby girl. I was only 14 and, um, and, and, and gave birth to her at the same time that I was giving birth to myself in a way. And, uh, giving birth to a world of thoughts and um, ideas and experiences by way of my writing. And so I've continued to write in that same way um, and continually reminded by my work and the work of so many others that um, this is a sacred practice and that, that it's, it's meaningful, it's deeply meaningful. It's an act of survivance. Um, it's an act of creative resistance and love to continue to make art and to continue to write um, and love one another in this way with our with our creating. Um, and so I would love to share a, a short piece with you. Um, so many good sisters, curators who did the um, Yahoo art show, bringing together multiple indigenous visual artists and poets and, and so many artists across mediums. Um, they, they invited me to edit a really special zine called um, uh, um, uh, uh, it was an indigenous, indigenous zine. It was actually two, um, two, two volumes. Um, and this is a short piece from, from the zine. And I began the piece with a word in uh, my language, which is Kari, this is the Akama language, and it's Shitrani, which means seeds. 
And you'll hear lots of words um, in this piece in, in different tribal languages. Shotrani, we travel, we wake as waves, as bodies of water, breath, sky, blood born, land hewn, urgent, ancient children yet rising. Shlomo, Ko, Kachani, Ya, Ins Iman, Ainoki, Ko, Aslatli, Masi Kochi. Rain to gather, rain, corn to plant, to be thirsty, rain, live there, may you sleep. Prophecy, the Hanu, sacred maps in this child, the people, be as strong as the water, land, stars, and sky made you, the ancestors, they are here. The way that my my dad's writing has been just different um, lyrical influences. There is like almost like a natural, a natural kind of rhythm or music that um, and lyricism that comes into my my poetry. And I don't, I don't really try to apply too much craft to it either. I'm like, well, if there's a, a sort of song that's coming through me, then I better just let it let it come. <laughs> What inspires and sustains you? I think it's so important to to meditate on what what feeds us, what what inspires us and nourishes us. We ask our native students um, at our Native Youth Leadership Academy, and if uh, use this in different spaces, we ask them, "What is your medicine?" Um, and and do a little framing around that, and in terms of you know what what. What keeps you strong and healthy? What keeps you going? What nourishes you day to day, especially when things get hard? Pandemic, I'm talking to you. <laughs> there are so many things that 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 we face as human people. And so it's important to be reaffirmed in what, what feeds us and keeps us going. And for me, um, it's, it's changed in some ways over time and not in others. I've been taught by um, so many um, good, good mentors, especially native writers and scholars, um, deep thinkers, uh, who have, in one way or another, been advocating for a rehumanization, a rehumanizing, especially in education spaces and all those spaces where native children, in particular, were harmed and, in many cases, are still being harmed that their very humanity and this also goes for our for our black students and latinx students and many students who are who are still marginalized today the native students who are brought to boarding schools taken sometimes thousands of miles away from their tribal communities and told that their ceremonies were wrong that their languages were wrong that their culture their their, their very humanness was wrong that they weren't that they weren't human um, in, in, in many ways and that they were going to be taught how to be human in these schools. And that practice is still going on, um, iterative as it is in American education. And so I was taught from a very early age that I needed to um, be a teacher. Even though I was very young, I needed to teach others about colonization. I needed to teach people about what had happened um, to our people, my own grandma and grandpa taken away to boarding schools and um, grandpa uh, running away from boarding school trying to get back to, to Akama and and that I, that was part of my my story even, even though it's difficult I needed to tell my own story in an act of survivance in an act of rehumanizing um, different spaces especially those education spaces that I was within and so it's taken me full circle to the work that I do today whether it's um, my, my creative work, my work in community organizing or curating events or my, my district work. It really is about bringing the, the humanity back to spaces where um, sometimes it's taken out where we reduce students to data. Um, we reduce students to their test scores. Um, and, and it's uh, a violation. <laughs> and so anything we can do to undo harm to rehumanize and to um, to cultivate healing spaces 
for for our community. Um, that's really where it's at, and it's a it's a it's a life worth dying for, um, as it were. I, I can't imagine myself doing any other work because no matter what I'm doing, night or day, it really is um, a reaffirmation of that original commitment. How does your activism inform your art? How does your art inform your activism? My art and um, creative, creative work and activism advocacy has always been um, a, a confluence, um, a constellation of so many things, including um, things far outside the realm of what would be described as art or activism. Um, we are taught from the time that we're little, little um, as Akuma people to help, um, to always be of service. What can you do to help? Um, and so in that way, my, my creative practice, um, my advocacy and, and direct service in, in, in Highline Public Schools, um, community organizing, all of that work is to be of help and to um, stay committed to that original <laughs> teaching. Like if you're, uh, you're, you're, you're in, the, in the house and there are lots of cousins and aunties and uncles and a meal is being prepared, you're not supposed to just be sitting down or playing a game. You should ask, you should ask one of the aunties or grandma or wh whomever, uh, what can I do to help even if you've just arrived. Um, and so um, in, in that way, there are, are so many opportunities to, to, to help and to be of service. And we do that. And I, I offer this up to um, students that I work with in terms of um, doing uh, work in, 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 in the art world and being an artist and, and being a professional artist, that that is a service um, in and of itself that sometimes uh, we have siloed artists or we've said that you have to uh, get an MFA to be an artist, you have to do a particular thing or be on a particular path to be an artist, but we tell our students all the time that they are they are scientists, they come from a legacy of original scientists, original architects, original artists, and all of these indigenous legacies of which they are a part were um, to be of service, to be of help to the community and to the world. Um, so whether they practice as an artist or they want to be um, a, a, a biologist or they want to uh, make music, whatever they want to do that, um, that they that they should do it with the with the remembrance that they are here to serve their community, to serve to serve their family, and to never never think in terms of just I, but but always we and the the collective continuum that we're all a part of. How does resiliency show up in your work? Uh, a leadership team that I serve on, Native Voices um, Academy and Curriculum Project. Um, we've been tackling this idea of, of survivance and resiliency um, and what it means in the lives of Native youth in particular, Native children and youth, and um, also our, our Native community more, more broadly and thinking about us being um, the successors, being the, the, the survivors after a long, long line of, of so many of our people who didn't make it and who were, um, who were harmed over and over and over again by the, the, the settler colonialist uh, colonizing enterprise that is America. Um, and when we think about ourselves in terms of being all within that continuum of survivors and being here today, having breath, having presence and, 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 and spirit and, and, and life to go forward. Um, survivance, uh, which is a, a term that's often used, it's basically survival plus resistance. And I add creative resistance in that, in that that's um, something a little bit uh, different and a little bit um, bigger to describe uh, what what really is in us as as native people um, as human survivors of um, some pretty pretty difficult things throughout history um, we would not have survived without our stories we would not have survived without our languages 
and those worlds of cultural knowledge. They contain, we would not have survived without each other and we wouldn't have survived without hope. And we have all of those things today um, in massive amounts, even in the difficult times that, that we're in. And often uh, resiliency, um, we, we, we tell our native students or have told our native students, you have to be resilient, you have to be resilient, you're so resilient. Um, but we um, have been digging deep into the work of a, an indigenous scholar, um, Leilani Subzelian, who has offered up this idea that when we speak in terms of resiliency, we're putting the weight um, on our native students uh, in, ter in terms of um, surviving systems that weren't built to serve them and um, saying that they have to just make it through by being resilient. Uh, but when we offer up this um, framework of, of survivance, um, that, that sort of repositions the the power and um, and and the 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 burden for for systems, especially of American education, to 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 realize that those students within them, it's it's not their job to be resilient. They already have all the power and all the agency and the brilliance. Um, it's our job if we work in those systems to protect that that power and that brilliance and not make them feel like they're running the gauntlet and that they they always need to survive somehow within that system. Um, but our, our, our native students are, are strong and powerful and, and beautiful and, and possess so much of this cultural and communal um, family knowledge. Um, all the knowledge that they, that they have now um, should be centered and elevated and they should be honored for, for, for not just being the children or the, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren of the survivors, um, but for, for being exactly who they are um, and carrying all of that, that, that power inside of them. What gives you hope for the future? What gives me hope for the future is thinking and feeling deeply the, the, the importance of this time and the, the privilege uh, the precious thing of being alive in this time. Um, I speak about a lot kind of that ancestral continuum and being a part of a long line of ancestors who fought and dreamed and lived so that I could have life. And I can't um, ever think of myself outside of that continuum. Uh, I, I really feel just so grateful and grateful and hopeful going hand in hand in me in that um, I know that I, I, I live a, a, a very comfortable life and that even though I have experienced discrimination and racism and dehumanization, um, that I, I, I stand on really solid ground in a lot of ways and I have all of my ancestors standing around me and I have all of my relatives holding me close so that I can do the work of my life in service. To, to others and um, in service to all of them and, uh, as well um, who, are, who are always with me. Uh, there's no way, for me anyway, that I could not have hope um, being held so closely um, in that way, being taken care of in that way by my community, by my, by my ancestors, by all of my many, many relatives and all of those um, extended relatives who um, who are even my my colleagues who I work with my nine to five is is sacred work to me and so I'm hopeful about that also I know that's not true for so many uh, of our people in, in this country also where it's like my job is just a job my job is the work of my life and it is what my ancestors and all of my teachers have have positioned me to do um, and so that that gives me so much hope and just gratitude that I'm allowed to go forward in that way. And I will do my best to, to support all of those learning spaces and cultivation spaces for, for our students so they can, they can also work in that way.